Okay. It says we're live. All right. Okay. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Hi. Okay. So this is Stay Home and Read. Uh, and I'm Adam Becker, and uh, I'm here today with Christy Schwanden, who is the author of the excellent book, Good to Go, uh, How What the Athlete and All of Us Can Learn from the Strange Science of Recovery. Um, Christy, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Thanks for having me, Adam. This is really a great idea. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, no, we're, we're having fun with it, uh, just getting it off the ground. So yeah, um, how are you doing? Let's start with just, you know, how, how you're Loaded doing. Loaded question yeah. these days, isn't it? It's like, it's no longer like, oh yeah, yeah. It's like, oh God, how, how are we all doing? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, these are, these are at the very least interesting times and certainly troubling and uncertain times. So, yeah. um, how are you holding up out there in Colorado? You know, I'm doing okay. I'm doing yeah, I feel pretty privileged, actually. I live in Western Colorado. Mm. I live on a nice little farm. So like, I can be do doing the social distancing thing and, <laughs> you know, not having to uh, change my daily life all that much. I mm -hmm. can still walk my dog in the morning and not see anyone. Um, I can go running, skiing, things like that. Um, cross country skiing, I mean, without without too much trouble our trails are still open and things like that there's there's definitely a lot of daily life things that are different and it's made me realize how much of my social life is sort of face-to-face -face things that i hadn't thought of you know <laughs> sort of, because of my work life you know i work from home and so that part hasn't really changed but yeah. the other stuff has changed a lot but i think you know i'm really lucky in that my family and friends are all healthy so far um that's well, not true of everyone, of course. There's a lot of terrible stuff going on, but I yeah. feel lucky that so far we've sort of uh, escaped that. Um, but there's just sort of this anxiety, not just about getting sick and the people that are sick, but the things that are happening with the economy. And I'm just basically trying to not think about uh, what's happening to our profession and whether we'll all still have work in six months or a year. Um, <laughs> I remember the last recession was pretty difficult, um, you know, for freelancers and staffers and you know, journalism in general. I had a lot of uh, journalist friends who've been uh, laid off or having uh, salary cuts. There's a round of those this week, multiple friends of mine. So yeah, yeah, these are, you know, it's pretty anxious times and it's just, I think, yeah, the human brain is not very good at dealing with uncertainty and we're in such a period of, I mean, this is all about uncertainty. And like, right. for me, I think the one thing that's really been helping the most is to just sort of accept, like, I don't know what the summer is going to be like, <laughs> you know, there's yeah. stuff that I want to do in the fall. I'm like, I don't know if that's going to happen. Like, I yeah. can't like, but also like, I can't know right now. So like, there's no sense in like, like sort of just putting off, like giving myself permission to like live more fully in the moment, which that sounds really woo woo and everything, which I'm, you know me well enough to know I'm not a woo person, <laughs> but it is, there is something about, you know, I have been just sort of embracing like, you know, the, the daily things of life that are enjoyable because you, know, you can't, think too much beyond that so that's been nice and I have to say you know, last year I was on book tour most of the year it was really great but it was also sort of exhausting and yeah. at the beginning of this year you know I literally said to myself I really want to travel less and I thought I would really like to travel not at all this year you know but I didn't mean like I swear I was like oh god I did I oh like, so I you're the one who yeah, made the right. monkey's paw wish yeah. this is all exactly. your fault yeah <laughs> Uh, but I have to tell you, this is a little bit of an aside, but I think it's a relevant one. Uh, back in 2010, was it 2009, um, I decided, I actually did a project where I drew a, a circle around my house of a hundred mile radius. And I decided to stay within this, it's calling it the hundred mile habitat. Hmm. I stayed within that for a year. So I didn't travel. I didn't get on a plane. You know, I got wow. in my car really did a lot of exploring in my local environment, which I had not, you know, all those places that you don't go to because they're so close that you can go to them anytime. And so you don't, Yeah, that was great. But I've been thinking about that a lot because that was probably one of the happiest years of my life. Oh. And so much of it was being grounded at home and being like yeah. really committed to my place. And so now we're in a situation that's much different, um, but in the same sense that we're all at home and we can't have that social interaction stuff that was you know, enriching my life that year. Um, but I think that there is something to that. And so I'm trying to sort of fall back into that and, and sort of, you know, being fully present in my life here at home, at my place, connecting with people in my communities, whether they're far flung or at home, you know, doing that in the ways that we still can and sort of taking time to think about the things that are important. And I think that, you know, in some ways, 
look, I'm not going to try and find silver linings in this stuff. I think it's absolutely horrible what's happening. And, you know, I don't even want to get into the lack of leadership and all that that's <laughs> happening, all the things that are making it worse. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that you know, in some ways, you know, if we can, it's a chance to sort of reset and think through what we're really doing. So I'm just trying to lean into that. And I'm, I'm fortunate and that I'm in a good situation to do that. And I feel like I, I'm in sort of the best possible world to do that. So that's pretty privileged. How about you, Adam? I mean, I know you're you're there in Oakland and there's, you know, a lot more density and things. Do you feel like yeah. you can go outside and, you know, not get the side eye? Do you have to put a mask on? Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky in that I live in one of the slightly less densely populated areas in Oakland. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not like right in the heart of downtown, although I'm not that far from downtown. Um, and so, you know, as long as I walk in the correct direction from my house, you know, or from my apartment rather, um, I'm mostly passing like some single family houses or, or like low density apartment buildings. And so I can take a, a nice walk, you know, around the hill that I live on. Um, and, uh, and you know, that the hill's pretty steep. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, I can There's get to steep the hills around there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so I can go from, you know, the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill and back a couple of times you know, get, get a good workout, get out of breath and not see anybody or see almost nobody. So that's good. Yeah, um, that's but it is, you know, it is a little weird to just not leave Oakland. I haven't left Oakland in over a month. And, mm -hmm. um, and I had also been thinking, you know, having been on book tour, not that long ago that I wanted to travel less this year. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are. What you but, wish for. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's been it's been difficult, but you know we're dealing with it, and and I also feel very privileged, very lucky. You know, my family's fine, uh, uh, my friends are fine. I have a couple of friends who had the virus and recovered, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and you know my my job situation is relatively stable. My my wife's job is stable. So yeah, we feel very lucky, but, uh, but yeah, and, and we can get out of the house in Oakland without too much trouble. So yeah, uh, definitely in a similar situation in that I feel very privileged and very lucky in the middle of all of this tragedy. Um, yeah. so yeah, but speaking of being out of breath, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, your book is about the science of recovery, uh, and, I had a question. I wanted to start with a question. You said that, uh, you know, you've you've been asked basically all the questions that you think you're going to be asked. About yeah. It. Um, so I'm going to try to try. ask. I'm going to try to start with a question that maybe you haven't been asked, which is um, when you gave me this copy, you signed it and uh -huh. it says, be sure to get lots of sleep. Yes. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. I said that as sleep is the most potent recovery tool known to science. Okay. And this is, you know, my book is sort of all about um, this mad rush now to create products and services and things to enhance recovery in athletes. And so mm -hmm. the idea is, you know, you work out hard and then you want to have maximum recovery so that you'll get the most benefit from your workout be most refreshed for your next workout or performance, whatever it is that you're doing. And so there's just been this sort of renewed interest in recovery, which is great because it is really important for athletic performance and for athletic achievement and all of this. Um, but what's happened is we've had all of these sort of goods and services that come in and they, they at best might have tiny, tiny little infinitesimal benefits. Whereas you know, something very basic like sleep um, has a huge benefit, but it's sort of like, it's the boring stuff. Like everyone knows sleep and like, no one wants, the other thing is no one wants to do it. Like people would much rather go buy something, like download the app or, you know, whatever, pay someone to like manipulate them or whatever, rather than just go to bed an hour earlier, say, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's, you know, if it, when it sort of is boiled down to its essence, you know, one of the most important things that you can do for athletic recovery is sleep. And it's something that, you know, on the one hand, it's really basic. It's kind of, I think of it as a momism. It's like the thing you already know, your mom told you you should do it. 
Um, but it's also something that like we're sort of universally bad at. People just really, and it really comes down to something interesting. And I've sort of noticed this, um, not just while I was writing the book, but as I was on tour and talking to people and interacting with folks who are reading the book and coming to my book talks and things, is that people just don't prioritize it. And they're sort of resistant to prioritizing it. You know, so they might sort of give it, um, you know, they might talk about it a little bit, but when it comes right down to it, they don't want to give up that you know extra episode on Netflix or whatever it is that's keeping them up and preventing them from going to bed a little bit earlier or from sleeping in a little later, whatever it is that they need to do to prioritize sleep, because so often sleep is the thing that we all sort of cut into, or we, you know, it's it's like the thing that's malleable when really it's not malleable. And it's not just for athletic performance, this is for health and well being as well. And particularly right now, I just wrote a story um, of a column at Elemental, which is this magazine at Medium. And uh, I wrote a story recently about that, like what kind of exercise we need right now. And if you're trying to sort of stay healthy and enhance your health during this epidemic age, <laughs> the, during the pandemic. And one of the important things that kind of came away from that is that it's really important to do regular exercise, but recovery is extremely important too. And it's, it's almost more important than ever to do these sorts of self-care things of which sleep is a major component of that. And so you know, just making, taking care to get your eight hours a night. And it's, it's amazing um, for people who aren't doing this when they, when they are actually able to do it. I mean, it can really be life-changing. Yeah. No, that, that, that makes sense. Um, so what, so, so you said that people are, are sort of resistant to sleep that they'd rather do, you know, almost anything else like buy something or, or, you know, pay for a service or something like that. Well, I'll just give you an example. I was yeah. at this. I was at this conference. Um, actually, I won't go into the details of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was hanging out with these postdocs. We were actually like waiting to get on the little bus to go to the conference from the hotel, and they were talking about their alarms that they used and like how they would put it across the room to sort of get them to get up and these different clever ways that they had of, of setting an alarm that was going to be more effective for getting them up. And I was just laughing saying, you guys are totally missing the boat. Like it's not <laughs> the, the fact you, you shouldn't need an alarm. Like the fact that you're having this trouble getting up and you're, you're having to do weird things with your alarm in order to yourself that's telling you that you're not getting enough sleep and so the fix here is not a better alarm or a more clever one or one that's you know doing something else it's that you're not getting enough sleep and so you need to go to bed earlier or find a way to be able to sleep in a little bit and you know it's not i, I want to be really clear just telling people to sleep more it's not always easy so it's something that sounds really easy but you know one thing that comes up and this is something that's true of me i'm sort of a night owl i'm not you know um if you just left to my own devices, I would sleep in pretty late every morning and stay up, stay up late. But our society yeah. isn't sort of set up that way. And, you know, depending on what, what your lifestyle is, you may not have a choice. So your body may want to sleep till 9 a.m. every morning, but you can't do that. Well, if you can't do that, you need to find a way, whether it's napping sometime during the day or whatever. So there are issues. It's, I, I don't want to like dismiss that and say, well, it's just as easy as going to bed you know, two hours early, because, you know, if you can't do that, or you're not naturally falling asleep at that time, it can be difficult. Um, but I think that we really, you know, so often the fixes are not as complicated as we want to make them. I'll give you another example. Um, a lot of people that are sort of struggling with insomnia, um, one thing that I found can be helpful is for them to hide the alarm clock or to ha basically not give themselves access to that clock. So if you're waking up in the middle of the night, and looking at the clock, it creates it sort of creates this anxiety loop, whatever. Mm. So if you don't give yourself the ability to know what time it is or to think about what time it is and to just think, okay, I'm awake and I can choose to go to sleep or whatever. And maybe you have an alarm set, but it's gonna wake you up at whatever time it's gonna wake you up, but right. you're not fixating and watching the clock. And it's amazing. I've told three different people about this. This is <sighs> totally anecdotal, but three different friends of mine who are struggling with, with um, insomnia. And I said, you know, why don't you just try this? And one of my friends was like, no, I'm not, that's not going to work for me. And finally, I was like, why don't you just try it for one night? And she came back and was like, oh my God, that totally worked. <laughs> so, so sometimes the, the, you know, the things can be um, fairly simple. And this is part of like sort of a cognitive behavioral approach too, right? Like you don't, you want to sort of shut down that cycle of anxiety and sometimes when people can't sleep. I mean, I've heard a lot of people saying that they're having trouble sleeping right now during this pandemic. Because, yeah. Look, there's a lot of anxiety and rightly so. And so 
figuring out ways to sort of shut that off, but I'm not going to pretend that I have all the answers and it's not always easy to do. But finding ways to break those cycles and those thought patterns can be really effective. Hmm. So, so speaking of, uh, uh, you know, asking or, or giving advice to a small number of people uh, as opposed to, you know, having a rigorous scientific study to bag something. Yeah. Um, one of the first things you talk about in the book is this study that you helped to conduct <laughs> about yeah. whether or not beer would help people be better runners. Yes. <laughs> um, how did that end up happening? Um, well, let's start with that. I have some follow-up questions. Yeah, but, I yeah. bet you do. Yeah, so the first chapter of the book is all about beer and running, and it's um, you know my way of interrogating this very important question, which is, is beer the ideal recovery drink, right? You know, right. the scenario is this, and this is not, you know, it's not just me and my friends being weirdos, but this has become very common. You know, people do a hard workout, whether it's a run or gym workout, whatever it is. And often this, there's a social aspect to this too. I've been in multiple running clubs where it's like a happy hour run. So after work, you get together, you go for a run, and then you go have beers afterwards. And so the idea here was, I just started wondering, you know, we like to do this. This is a common thing that runners do, but is this bad for you? Like, are you basically undoing all the good that you did with your running by drinking this alcohol? And like, right. what do we really know about it? And so I had gone to the scientific literature to try it. You know, I did what I normally do, which is, okay, what does the science show? It turned out that there weren't a lot of studies on this. There were some studies about alcohol and athletic performance, but most of the studies were like, it was funny, a lot of them were actually, they would give people alcohol before or during exercise, which is like, whoa, 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 that's not what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. And like, <clears throat> you know, who's going to drink whiskey before a run? Like, certainly not me. I'm sure that there are people that do that. Um, it's probably not very healthy. <clears throat> but anyway, um, you know, and then the some of the other studies that I was able to find for some reason, there were a lot of studies out of like New Zealand and and UK with rugby players. And apparently rugby players can really, I mean, they could drink us all under the table because these studies were like, you know, they would they would have them do this exercise in the lab and then throw back like seven or eight or 10 beers, which I'm just like, oh my God, you know, I'm talking here about one beer, maybe one and a half, possibly two over two hours or something. You know, this is like a completely different scenario. And so Anyway, long story short, I wasn't finding the answer that I want. It wasn't just that I wasn't finding the answer that I wanted. I wasn't finding the kind of study I was looking for. So at the time, this was um, this happened a little bit before I started the book. I was writing a lot for Runner's World. And so I actually talked my editors there into sort of sponsoring the study. So I went and I found some local researchers at the local university here. And we set up this lab study to actually look at this exact scenario. And so we brought people into the lab. We had them do hard runs on the treadmill. I and mean, we did all this testing too to make sure they were sort of exercising at the right intensity. And then afterwards we gave them, you know, basically enough beer to where they could still be, le it was right below the uh, legal limit for driving. So you're having some beer, but you're not like too drunk to drive or you know, really buzz. So kind of under the threshold, the kind of, the kind of you know, moderate drinking that you might do on a more regular basis. And, um, you know, so you might think that this was going to put this question to rest and answer it definitively. But what ended up happening was um, we got a really exciting result. At least it was exciting for me because I'm a woman who's married to a man. And our study suggested that run, that uh, having beer after running was performance enhancing for women, but it was actually detrimental to performance for men. And so this was sort of my opportunity to say, sorry, honey, you're the designated driver. I'm the drinker. Like, you know, this is, <laughs> this is great, right? Like, this is an example, too, of like something that happens because scientists are all human is you get a, a result that's really exciting and that you really like. And you, there's this temptation to really believe it and fixate on it and and sort of give it more credence than it deserves. And so what what I found, though, as is that as excited as I was by this result, and as much as I wanted to believe it, I couldn't believe it. And part of the reason is that I was also a participant in the study, which I'm glad that I was, because otherwise I may not have, you know, picked up on some of the things that I did, which was, you know, the first thing was um, the test that we were using to sort of measure recovery it turned out was kind of a bad test. And I realized that it was not a very accurate test. Furthermore, it was not 
really getting to the heart of what I wanted to know. So what I wanted to know is if I go out for a hard run, so like I just went for a run before this interview here. Now, if I drink a beer right now, am I wrecking myself for tomorrow? Will I feel lousy? You know, let's say I was doing a race tomorrow. Would that mean like, you know, it'd be done for? And this test that we were doing wasn't really answering that. And it was more of a psychological test. It was this thing called a run to exhaustion. So they put you on a treadmill and you're going at like just below your absolute maximum and you have to go as long as you can. And so it really becomes this sort of test of like, how into the study am I? Do I really want to keep going? Like, anyway, but, and it's not really a scenario that you're doing in real life. And there's no race that's like that, not a regular race anyway. And that's not really replicating the kind of scenario. And I really, you know, the reason I began the book with this study is because I think it gets to the heart of, of so many issues with scientific studies, which is, and I'm not here to tear down science. Science is great. It's the best way we have to understand the world. But what happens, and particularly in sports science, and this was kind of a, recur a recurring theme in my book, is that you have this like seemingly basic question, right? Is how does beer affect recovery? Basic question. But instantaneously, when you're setting off to study this, you face these questions that are really hard to answer, which is, you know, first of all, how are we going to measure recovery? What do we even mean by recovery? How do we measure it? How do we sort of induce this? How do we replicate in the lab and in this sort of controlled environment where we can measure the things we need to measure? How do we replicate this question and sort of the scenario in real life that we really care about? And so what I found is that actually science is really damn hard and i hope that anyone who reads the book will come away with understanding that you know there's a lot of crappy studies out there a lot of studies that that don't definitively answer our questions and it's not because scientists are terrible or they're you know they're cheaters or lying or whatever it's that science is just really hard and it can be really difficult to answer questions particularly about human physiology which is very complex and you know there's so many different factors that go into it and so yeah, the other thing is with sports and, and sports performance, you know, we actually care a lot about very small differences. So like if there was something I could do that would give me a five or 10% advantage, that's huge in sport. Whereas, you know, in other contexts that might not be meaningful, you know, in medicine, that might not be a clinically meaningful result, depending on the scenario, what it is. Right. And so that makes it even trickier because you're looking for these tiny little differences in variables that are very, very highly variable because they have so many different inputs. Our human physiology has a lot of things. So, you know, your recovery is not just about whether you drank that beer. It's also how much did you sleep? How hard were you training the rest of the week? All of these other things that go into it. And it's very difficult to control all of those things when you're doing the study. And that's why it's so difficult to get these definitive answers that we really want. Hmm. Interesting. So, and you said this is a broader theme throughout the book. So, I mean, what does this say about science as a whole? I mean, you know, I, I agree with you completely that science yeah. is our, our best and most reliable way of knowing things about the world. But, you know, it, it, it at least feels like, you know, does beer help us run better is a reasonably simple question. Right, right. And so if we can't use science, like, or, or rather if it's not immediately obvious how to use science to address this question, like what do we, uh, you know, we're going to go straight from talking about sports to like deep philosophical issues here. Yeah. Um, right. How does science work? Tell us. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, Adam, you know me well enough to know. I mean, this is really a meta science book masquerading yeah. as a sports book. It, it really is. And that's, you know, my my real sort of ambition for the book is for people to come away with a better understanding of how science works and why it's so hard. And so I don't think that it's true that we can't answer the question about beer, but I think that it's just more difficult to answer with a single study. And it, it's sort of like the elephant in the room question, you know, where you're sort of touching this thing and trying to, okay, it's, it's a big animal. I know that. Okay. The skin feels kind of love, you know, you're, it's sort of this process of uncertainty reduction. And so it's going to take multiple steps and you can't do it in one fell swoop with one single study. And you need to sort of not just replicate things, but sort of find those areas of uncertainty and find the things that are like, okay, what are the things that are confounding the results that we get? And what, what is that telling us about our basic problem? You know, so is it something, so here's an example. So alcohol is known to, you know, if you drink enough alcohol, it's going to impair your sleep. So it's possible that like maybe if alcohol is bad for your recovery, it's because of the sleep issue. And so it may not be, um, 
you know, something that's happening while you're drinking the beer that can be interacting with this other thing. And maybe if you are in bed and give yourself more time uh, to, to sleep, maybe the effect of that is less. I'm making this up, but like there, there are variables like that that you have to take into consideration. Um, there were some uh, sort of hints that there could be something going on with um, glycogen replenishment in the muscles. So your, your muscles run on this fuel called glycogen. and It lo looks like it's possible that alcohol may um, impair that to some degree. We didn't really look at that in our study. That's something that there's just been hints. So it's tricky, but you have to look at all of these different things and sort of look at them in multiple settings. Because the other issue too is you can find something that's really robust in the lab and something that you can replicate in the lab, but that doesn't mean that it's meaningful in the actual real life situation that you care about. And so I have a whole chapter in the book about hydration. And I think this is a really good example of it. Hydration has basically become this like really important thing because you have these sports drink manufacturers who have created who have made it this really big thing and it turns out that your body is actually extremely well adapted to perform and to be able to um you know do exercise under different environmental conditions and to you know lose fluid through sweat and still be able to perform like it's not you're not going to die and in fact your performance um there, it's interesting in running anyway, in some of the endurance sports, um, some of the world records have actually been set with people who are, you know, by some of these standards set by sports drink manufacturers dangerously dehydrated. Well, it turns out that your body, you know, can adapt to that fluid loss and it's not necessarily performance um, hindering. But what you can do is if you go in the lab and you're measuring things in the right way, or you're just looking at these clinical things that you can see. So like hydration levels, um, in an athlete, so you may say, well, the fluid balance is this, and we're seeing that it's, it's you know, as you're losing the, your fluid level is going down, but you're making an assumption that in the real life when you're performing, that's going to have a performance detriment. And, and we know that that's not necessarily the case. And so it's very easy to sort of confuse things. So just because you can measure something doesn't mean that that's the variable that's important and that's determining the thing that you really care about. So like if I'm running a marathon, the thing I care about is what is my time going to be when I'm finishing, you know, coming right. across the line. I, I also want to feel pretty good. You don't want to do something sure. that's going to make me feel really crappy during it. But like, you know, that's much more important than, you know, what's the osmosality of my blood? Like that's not some like that. I only care about that to the extent that it affects my performance and my overall finish time. And when you look at this, it's like, oh, these things that they're measuring aren't actually the right correlates of that. And in fact, you know, we've, we've created, I described this in the, the chapter, um, that we've actually created the situation where people are so concerned about staying hydrated and drinking enough fluids that we actually have people dying of overhydration during marathons. Um, when, you know, there's never, I looked, there's never been a documented case of someone dying of dehydration during a marathon because your body can adapt to that. It doesn't mean that you, you know, if you get really dehydrated, you might not pass out and have problems and whatever, but like, there's never been a documented case of death by dehydration during a marathon, but there have been multiple deaths from people drinking too much fluid. So, you know, these huh. marketing things and this sort of paying attention to the wrong things can have deadly consequences. It's not just, you know, academic, uh, you know, talk about things that are esoteric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. That's, I mean, I think I vaguely knew that overhydration was physically possible, yeah. but I, I not sure I knew that people had died of overhydration during marathons. It's tragic. And there've been, uh, you know, high school football players, other um, army uh, military folks. In fact, I talk in the book, um, some of the, um, you know, uh, what do we want to call them? Military operations in the Middle East, they've had, um, you know, more soldiers evacuated for overhydration than from you know, enemy fire in some instances because they were, you know, following these guidelines of you have to drink this much per hour and things like this. When it turns out, you can drink to thirst. Like that's, that's literally like the most physiologically like sound way to do this. Drink when you're thirsty, your body actually has sophisticated ways. You know, thirst is actually your body telling you you need to drink. And so this idea that you need a scientist looking over your shoulder and telling you what to do is kind of ludicrous when you think about it. Huh. 
And yet we have these like ad campaigns from uh, oh, yeah. from you know sports drinks like Gatorade, saying oh, yeah. that like this is what you need in order to you know achieve victory or whatever language they're using in their ads. Um, and and I've never, I hate Gatorade. I think it tastes very bad. <laughs> um, and so, but but I but I always assumed that it was doing something. They're very uh, convincing because they use all yeah. these you know, electrolytes. You know what electrolytes are? That's salt. You yeah. get that in your food. Like, <laughs> you know, on the one hand, your doctor may be telling you to like cut back on salt. But meanwhile, you've got Gatorade saying, oh, electrolytes, you need to replenish them. You know, and I've heard so many people tell me, oh, but you need electrolytes. And uh, yeah, you do. You get those from food. You can finish your run and have a, you know, if you're, have you ever like, finished exercising or something and kind of had a craving for something salty that's yeah. your body saying oh i need a little salt so you put a little extra salt on your food or you have a pretzel or whatever it is but this idea um <sighs> that you need to put the salt in the beverage is, is sort of silly <laughs> yeah i mean and and do they do they have studies to back up these claims that they're making in their ad campaigns i mean this is it, it's it seems very strange that they've been so successful, like that these companies have been so successful in marketing these products if the benefits are so marginal. Yeah, well, I mean, what I found in researching the book is that a lot of the stuff that's passing for science is really marketing. And so, yeah. you know, you know enough about science to know it's pretty easy to develop design a study that's gonna tell you what you want it to show. And this goes back to this idea of what are you measuring? Are you measuring performance? Or are you measuring these things that, you know, we can show that, you know, giving people electrolytes or giving them fluids, you know, can change different measures that you can take in the lab. But again, is that the performance measure that you really care about? And many, many cases, the answer is no. And so you have to be really careful there about, you know, seeing what they're telling you. <laughs> And, and you were saying earlier, you know, one study isn't really going to give you the answer. You need multiple studies. Um, yeah. And yet when I see like, when I see ad campaigns or people talk about, you know, these sorts of products, there is usually reference to just one study or, or a very small number yeah. of studies. What's, what do you think is driving that? Is that, is that like, oh, it's marketing. I mean, yeah. look, you have, and there, this is very prevalent in the nutrition realm. So you have you know, the whatever f magical fruit, we have all these superfoods now. And so you yes. have, I mean, you can name whatever, there's all kinds of different fruits, blueberries, uh, cherry juice, you know, you name it. There, there's right. dozens of these. And so, you know, the super fruit growers of America get together and then they create a grant for people to, it, so, you know, conflict of interest is not just, we so often think of it as like, okay, someone's handing you, Gatorade's handing you a, a load of money and they're saying, just prove that our thing works. That's not how it works. Right. You know, right. they are, they can exert a much stronger influence and buy much more credibility by basically finding researchers that already have credibility, giving them money to study things and saying, okay, we want you to, we're going to fund you to study hydration. Well, all of a sudden now you have all these studies on hydration. It's sort of just the fact that they're funding those studies raises hydration to this level, like this must be really important. And then you can create protocols and sort of approaches to this that, um, you know, again, it's very easy to, to measure things like, okay, how much fluid is someone losing in the lab when they're riding an exercise bike? That's fine, but do we re is that really the thing that we care about? Or do we care about how they're going to be feeling, how they're going to be performing, how they're going to be adapting to say performance in the heat in real life in a bike race or in a marathon or something like that? Hmm. Hmm. And and do you think that we, we also need to be doing a better job of sort of informing the public of how science works? Like the fact that one study isn't really definitive? Because I, I do think that uh, there's, you know, we, I'd like to think that you and I do a better job when we report on science, but there's a lot of reporting on science where people report the results of one study, right? Yeah. And yeah. and that's not necessarily going to be uh, a result that holds up, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And what I yeah. found is that in sports science, I mean, the sort of 
it's interesting. So there's, there are every sort of field of science and little domain of science has its own culture and its own accepted norm. So yeah. it's like, what is acceptable in one realm may be completely unacceptable in another, right? Like, so there are things that are done in psychology that would be absolutely like never taken seriously in physics, right? Yes. You know, yeah. I'm talking about p-values and things like that, <laughs> right? Yes. And I mean, all of the, I mean, you're, you're, I think you're as familiar as I am with the issues that psychology has been confronting. And, you know, yeah. I'll say one thing about psychology is this sort of makes them look really bad because they're saying, oh, crap. Up. like we've been doing all these studies and pumping out those results might not be reliable and like we've been using methods that are basically elevating spurious results and, and favoring results that probably aren't correct mm -hmm. but now they're going going back and saying okay we need we want to change this and so in the process they may look kind of bad but the fact that they're even noticing it and paying attention and doing it is is sort of saying something right and i think sports science is at like where psychology was at you know many years ago, but probably worse because their sort of standard acceptable practices are sort of much less rigorous than what you see in psychology. And so as I went about reporting this book, what I found is again and again, I was looking at these studies and I'm like, this is like, is this even, should this even be published? I mean, it's really, really common hmm. for them to have studies where the, the study arm has eight people or 10 people. And I mean, that's just, really? yeah, I know. I love how your eyes are getting really big. I mean, oh, well, it's, just I, like, it's just not a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And so you can't, I mean, there's such so much sampling error and not like basically the, all, for all the reasons that, you know, have been interrogated and discussed at length in other fields of science, you know, this is sort of the status quo in sports science. And, you know, huh. when I first started talking about some of this stuff, people just sort of looked at me with glassed over eyes and, no, you know, I really was sort of greeted as like this nasty person who was coming in and trying to cut the field down. In the meantime, though, there's been, and I think that it, it is sort of a result of what's going on in psychology, there's been a movement now to try and improve the quality and the reproducibility and the rigor of sports science. There's a new um, uh, society that's formed to try and address some of these things. And it's interesting, in the same way that in psychology, this is very much driven by sort of younger um researchers and people who are coming up in the field yeah. um this is also the case in sports science and you know i think that's just how it works because the people who are in power now and who have become successful um up to this point got there using whatever crappy methods that they're using right. so they're not going to be the ones who want to change it and no one wants to say oh maybe i built my career right. on a house of cards which <laughs> i think is you know a real situation in some of these cases and so it's tricky huh. and i think with sports science it's really hard too because you know, there's a re there is a reason why they have so many small studies, and that is that just the logistics of doing and the cost and all of this of doing these studies can be really difficult. Um, you know, good luck finding 200 elite cyclists to come in your lab and do the study, not to mention the amount of time it would take to do each of these things. You know, it's not like a psychology study where you can give someone a survey, you know, online or something like that. And so it's really, there are logistical and legitimate, I will say, reasons for these small sample sizes. But at the end of the day, you're sort of producing this dodgy data. And so do you just decide, well, that's the best we can do is to not ha have answers that are really, really squishy and probably not reliable. And, you know, we're just going to pretend that they're better than they are. Or are we going to say, look, this is not acceptable. We need to come up with better ways. And I think that's sort of the discussion that's happening now in the field. And that's exciting because I think that you know, real change is happening. And I think that it will happen moving forward. And I'm already seeing signs of this. And there's talk about um, pre-registration and things like this and more openness with the open data and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's promising, at least. And we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So just in terms of practical takeaways here, yeah. um, get sleep. Get sleep, yes. Right? Uh, drink when you're thirsty. Drink when you're thirsty. It really is that simple. Yeah, and and drink water when you're thirsty. Drink water when you're thirsty. Yeah, you don't yeah. need... So it gets a little bit tricky. If you're doing long endurance mm -hmm. exercise, then carbohydrates can be helpful. Salt is maybe not as important. If you're eating any kind of food, you'll be getting salt with that you don't need to be like preloading or anything like that 
Um, but yeah, drinking to thirst is really the optimal. And this is the other thing. I mean, this has like gotten into daily life too. You see now everywhere you go, everyone's bringing a water bottle around and it's like, yeah, you yeah. don't need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that is, yeah. No, I've seen that too. And yeah. that is strange. Although, yeah. well, but when I met you at Courage Camp, we all yeah. had water bottles, but that's because we were at what? 8,000 feet, 9,000 feet. Yeah. And I mean, I will say it's, I'm not saying don't drink and don't, and I think it's really smart to like make sure that you have water available when you need it. But the idea that you need to drink once an hour or on some sort of schedule, right. you know, in some cases it might be good to check in with yourself. Am I feeling thirsty? Oh, I'm feeling thirsty. Like, you know, yeah. I, I get that. But this idea that yeah, you know, it's almost become hydration has become sort of a proxy for health and wellness, right? People say, Oh, stay hydrated. And it's like, yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay, but but what else? So so get a lot of sleep. Uh, yes. Drink water when you're thirsty. Yeah. What what else should should we be doing if we want to stay healthy and recover from? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, exercise and physical activity. Yeah, I think the third pillar, and this is something that really does not get um, recognized to the extent that it should, is is reducing stress and addressing stress in your life, managing stress. Um, because to your body, stress is stress. So if you're really stressed out and under a lot of psychological or life stress, your body is going to be, you know, that's an additional stress that's preventing your body from recovering from your workout. And your, you hmm. know, that sort of buzzy stressed feeling is your body not relaxing, not taking care of itself, not, you know, fixing the damage that you did to your muscles and all of that. And in fact, you know, stress also can interfere with sleep, all of this stuff is related. I mean, that's the other thing. There's, it's not like one or the other, they're all sort of interrelated. But I think, yeah, particularly in this moment that we're at right now, you know, we just, it's so important to find ways and to find like daily rituals and daily, you know, making stress management a daily part of, uh, you know, we can't get rid of stress, but we can find ways to address it and find ways to deal with it and having rituals and things. I think it's really, really important to have some time in every day that's set aside for just like being where there's no pressure to be productive. There's no pressure to be doing things where you're just like genuinely relaxing and whether you're reading a book or just putting your feet up, drinking a beer, whatever it is, doesn't matter, but it's, it's just a time when there's no expectation and no pressure where you're really just relaxing. And it, it's kind of, I mean, I think it's telling that we have to now be told and we have to like teach people how to relax, but I think that's where we're at, honestly. Right. Huh? So, so what I'm hearing is drink a lot of water when you're, or sorry, drink water when you're thirsty. Yes. Get sleep. See a therapist. Yeah. That could be helpful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or at least, you know, meditate or relax or do something meditate, relaxing relax. each day. And I mean, that's the thing too. So meditation's great, but if meditation feels like work and if it's another thing that you're doing, then that's not, that's actually the wrong thing to do. And so right. like, even though I have a whole chapter on mindfulness and meditation and sort of stress and all of this stuff. And, but I think that it's really individual and a lot of people really love meditation and find it's really helpful but I think that you shouldn't do it if it becomes another like task on your to-do list and it becomes its own source of stress. I think you're much better off just like lying on the couch and looking up at the ceiling or lying in your backyard and looking up at the clouds, like really like just, but just, just sort of letting go of this expectation that I'm doing something or that I need to perform, or there's like some way that I'm grading what I'm doing. Right. <laughs> so yeah. And that, and that actually gets to a point uh, that, that's occurring to me as we're talking. So the things you, you said at the beginning, you know, people want to buy things they want yeah. to, um, or, or pay someone for a service or something like that, rather than doing these things like sleeping or drinking water, which is yeah. free when you're thirsty yeah. or, you know, taking time to relax and do nothing or do very little. Yeah. Um, and and I think that there is this pressure that you're talking about to to feel productive or to quantify what we're doing and 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 also there there's all of this advertising that's promoting these products. Yeah. Um and it, it's it sounds when when you put all that together, it starts to sound a little bit like 
an indictment not just of uh, the the culture of sport recovery products, but also of wider things about our society and the way that we run our economy and maybe even capitalism as a whole. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think, you know, so much of this too, we're living at this moment that's being so driven by that productivity and the capitalism and I, I, look, I'm not anti-capitalism, but it, it's like, you know, this idea that we always have to be buying or doing yeah. or producing or, you know, there was a, a really funny little video on the New York Times website a few months ago. I don't know if you saw it about how to be a more productive person that was basically taking all of these little tips and hints like to their most extreme. And it was like a day in the life of like the, the, the life hacker sort of person. And it was really, it was really funny and clever and, and well done the way that it sort of amplified. But I think we're mm -hmm. living in that moment where people feel like, you know, you don't just get up in the morning, you have to like get up in this optimal way. And maybe you're doing a stretch before you go to bed. And like every single moment has to be optimized. And we have this idea that there's like this idealized version of ourselves that we can achieve if only, you know, we do these right. little things or, you know, this one life hack away. And even just this whole notion of life hacking, right? Like it's kind of silly when you think about it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Yeah. So, um, so pivoting a little bit away from the book itself to uh, sort of, you know, the books about meta science, like you said, if we can talk about the meta book. So what what prompted you to write the book in the first place? And yeah, yeah, I, I think the thing that really convinced me that this was a good fit for me, you know, this was a good topic that I was interested in is, you know, I'm was really interested in the whole meta science stuff, the stuff we've already been talking about and, you know, weird, you know, questionable research practices and all of that. But this felt like an opportunity to write about all of that stuff in a context that people care about. Like most people aren't going to read 300 pages of like, you know, study design, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <clears throat> but they might read about like, oh, here are these products that are being marketed to me. I want to know if they work or not. Like here's the, so it's sort of like a way for me to, you know, deliver that broth in a really delicious, you know, main course meal that people <laughs> wanted to eat, if that makes any sense. No, that, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah. that, that, that definitely makes sense in terms of, you know, wanting to make it compelling and put together a narrative structure that people will, yeah. you know, be drawn in by. So how did you, how did you go about, you know, choosing what subjects to cover? Like, how did you, how did you put the book together? I want to hear more about your process for, for yeah. actually, you know, structuring the book and, and, you know, linking each chapter together and whatnot. That was really, really hard, actually. Yeah. I mean, it was really hard for a couple of reasons. One is that there, I mean, there's literally like a million different products and things that I could have talked about. And so I had to make a lot of decisions about, yeah. I'm going to include this, I'm not going to include that and sort of figuring out how to make those decisions. And so I sort of tackled that by, putting things into bins. So it's like, okay, here are mind body approaches. Here are, I have a, a chapter called flushing the blood. There's all these products that are like massaging or, or mm -hmm. doing things, you know, that are supposed to increase circulation. So I kind of divided things into sort of like types of things. And mm -hmm. so I could address sort of the physiology on sort of a meta level and then look at individual products sort of like individually obviously so like there's a chapter about cold therapy icing cryotherapy is this hot thing now that's kind of all the rage or it has been i don't know if that's gonna survive in this economy we'll see <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so so that was sort of one approach that i took but then i mean the, the, look the hardest thing about writing this book was that <laughs> Basically, the things that work are the things that people already know. They're, they're coming to the book already knowing. Like, no one's like, oh, my God, I read this book. And did you know there's a thing called sleep and it's really helpful? You know, like, everyone already knows that, right? And the things that really work are things that are not surprised. People want to be surprised, right? And people yeah. want to know the secret. And the secret is there is no secret. And that as long as you're chasing the secret, you're actually, like, shooting yourself in the foot. And so the secret is to stop searching for the magic and accept the stuff that's that maybe doesn't feel like magic, but can actually work some magic if you really you know, put your focus on it. Um, so that was difficult. And then also just sort of making, you know, I didn't want it to be chapter one, 
this stuff is some bullshit. Chapter two, this also doesn't work. Chapter three, this is some other snake oil, you know, like <laughs> that, that's just not interesting. And also right. I didn't, want it, I didn't want it to be mean. Like I didn't want to, you know, and one of the things I have a whole chapter about placebos, but one of the things that I came to realize is that there are a lot of things that people do that are in fact helpful for recovery, but they may not be helpful. Like there's these sort of pseudoscientific or sort of science washing reasons that are given for why you do this. And so like massage is a great example of this. Like everyone loves massage. Massage is genuinely great for recovery, but it's not great for recovery because it's like flushing lactic acid out of your muscles or, you know, it's probably increasing your circulation. But if you're an athlete, you already have good circulation. So, but no, it's helping you because you're taking an hour out of your day to relax. You're unwinding. It feels really good. Like actually feeling really good is like, that. that's like a good sign that it's working. And so we don't actually need this like physiological explanation because it may be just more simple than that, that it's a way to relax and relaxing is good. I mean, at its most basic level, that's what recovery is. It's relaxing. And again, this goes back to my earlier point, which is, yeah, we're at a point where we have to like instruct people on how to relax. Like that's where we're at right now. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that is, that is kind of depressing, but I, but I yeah. also feel like, well, I mean, we're both freelancers. I, I definitely struggle with relaxing myself, especially because as a freelancer, there's not a good division between home and work. Yeah, that can be um, hard. So yeah, I I I hear that uh, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, so so that's that's really interesting. So uh, I had another question. What was it? Um, yeah, so so that's how you put the book together, and and what you decided to put in. Right, that's so. But what what about the nuts and bolts of your process? Like, how did you carve out the time to work on this while you were writing other things and working on other projects? Like, what what was your day to day? What did that look like when you were writing the book? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I was working at five thirty eight when I wrote this book, right. which was not. I would not recommend doing that it was a really difficult way and oh, i had but to, I, to be clear you're saying you would not recommend writing a book while working at some place like 538 you're not saying you don't recommend working at 538 right I, yeah i'm not gonna comment <laughs> on that but i i no, i writing a book while having a job is yeah. is really really hard it, especially because you know i think it's one thing if your day job is something that's not writing mm -hmm. but like i think of writing as like running like i can't run a marathon during the day and then come home at night and run another 10k like you're yeah. just too tired and like it's there's a certain emotional and sort of you know whatever effort that goes into it and so that was really tricky and i did take a short book leave um, that book leave began uh, right after the November 2016 election. Oh, so it wasn't, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was rough. Um, I was actually working at 538 that night on election night. It was, it was rough. Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm, that's part of the reason I'm, I'm just very glad to not be at 538 for this election. It just, yeah. Not good for my mental health. Anyway, moving past that though, I did take, I did take a few months off of work and, that was helpful, but I didn't actually get a lot of writing done in that time. It was just really hard. I found it really hard to get started on this in part because of this other stuff that was going on in the world. And I had some other personal stuff. I had um, a dear friend came down with this really aggressive cancer and died really quickly. And you know, there's there just other confounding things that made things hard. Um, but I did get it done. And I also am sort of a binge writer. Like that's just my nature. Like I just don't, I wish that I was the disciplined person who could write a thousand <laughs> words a day, but that's just not how I work. Um, for me, it's like the hard part is figuring out what I want to say. And then once I got that, then I write very fast and that's, but it's like, I just, I find that I want to take more time to like process things and figure it out. And that's, that's the part that's sort of most of the struggle. It's also the part that's most engaging to me. Like, so I don't, I don't actually want that to go away. It's an important part of the process because there's sort of like two different types of working, right? Like one is where you're like figuring out what it is and how you're going to put it together. And then at some point though, you're like, okay, so I know I'm going to have this chapter and then it's going to go like this. And then it's more like just sort of the execution. And I actually find that part of the process like more boring and hard. It's like harder just in the sense that like, 
it's not that engaging to me. So I just have to get it done, but it's yeah. just, it feels more like grunt work. Whereas the other stuff is like existentially much more difficult, but it's also like what I live for. Right. So it's, yeah. <laughs> and I'll just say here that like of my poor husband, like, I think it's really difficult to be married to a writer. Yep. Um, at one point he actually said, you know, you don't have to do this. You could do something else. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 that sounds familiar. Um, yeah. yeah, so one last question about process yeah. then, or, yeah, or like the background of, of writing the book. Yeah, and then we should probably wrap up. Um, so I don't think I'd realized before reading the jacket flap here um, <laughs> that that you used to be a competitive athlete, like like a professional athlete. Yeah. Um, like I, I knew that you had a background in sports, but I didn't quite realize that it was that serious so did that i mean how did that inform your work on reporting and writing the book like because you you were you were sort of coming in and looking at the way that the sports science was working but you you know i think unlike a lot of other people uh had, had actually been on the you know uh, uh, people people who work as science journalists often come either from the science side or the journalism side. But yeah. in addition to having like the science background, you actually had the background of being an athlete. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And so I came at it from that, you know, I had lived it and I had done this. And, you know, re recovery is something that I feel like as an athlete, I didn't do a very good job of, of managing, you know, and really mastering. Well, I mean, I, I did eventually, but it took me a large part of my career to sort of really figure it out. And I've seen so many, and th this is not like, I'm not some unique story in that it's, it's fairly common. And um, while writing the book, I, inter I interviewed some researchers in Scandinavia who had actually done a big project. They were sports psychologists where they interviewed a bunch of um, professional athletes who were at the end of their careers, you know, near retirement about what they wish they had done differently or known before. And the universal answer was they wish that they had taken uh, recovery more seriously when they were younger and had sort of gotten better at it and really and the stuff about stress and sleep those are things that people really pointed to that they wish that they you know that huh. when they were younger or they were newer at it they just didn't give it the importance or the attention that it deserved and so you know I think I fell into that as well hmm. and so is that part of what prompted you to go after this specific side of Sports, yeah. Oh, yeah, research. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I was interested, you know, I yeah. still do stuff. I'm not, I'm not a competitive athlete anymore. I just do it for do stuff for fun. But you know, as you get older, it gets harder to recover. And of course, I'm, I'm like, I'm at the age now where I'm like, super susceptible to the, the marketing too. It's like, well, you know, maybe if it, even if it's like half as good as it's claimed, like that's something like I'll take anything at this point. Right. So <laughs> yeah, there, there's part of that too. Like I genuinely was curious. Like I didn't approach this, like I'm going to go slay all these claims. Like I really was hoping, you know, I, I did want things to work. I wasn't, hmm. you know, because I'm a journalist, of course, I'm going to be skeptical about stuff and that's part of my job, but it wasn't like, you know, I was very open to wanting things to work and seeing things. Yeah. And in fact, you know, going back to what I was saying about massage as an example, there were a lot of things that I was skeptical about that I then sort of decided were helpful, but they were helpful for different reasons. And there were different, you know, sometimes we come about things, you know, going sort of looking at them so scientifically that we sort of miss these other aspects that maybe. I don't want to say that they're not scientific, but they're not, you know, they're not the things that we're measuring in the scientific way. So like something that's helping you reduce your stress, that's something that's tangibly good for you, but it's not necessarily the thing that we're measuring by like, um, you know, maybe we measure it by taking your blood pressure, which goes down. So there are things of doing that, but it's like, you can almost approach things where you're, you're looking at it from too much of a physiological perspective, instead of looking at sort of the whole process. Interesting. Great. Well, I think that's about all I've got. Is there anything else that uh, you wanted to talk about before we wrap things up? I don't think so. We've covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of stuff. I'm just, I'm, I'm glad that you're interested in the meta science stuff because you know, that's my jam. So yeah, yeah no, that's definitely mine as well. I'm, I've always yeah. been very interested in that. Um, but yeah. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today uh for stay this home is and read. fun adam it's yeah. always great to talk with you yeah. yeah it's great to talk with you too it's good to catch up um so once again the book is good to go 
uh, which is new. It's now it's out now in out paperback. In paperback too, yes, in paperback. fantastic. And look, it's got this cool little. I'm a finalist for the Colorado Book Awards. And oh, congratulations! I don't know how, I don't know if, how we. So they're supposed to announce the winners at the award ceremony, which mm. of course is not happening now. So. I don't know, but we're do we are doing. I'm really excited. We're doing a, a video sort of thing like this, the readings that were supposed to be happening, you know, on stage somewhere. So that will be fun. It's not a it's not a, an, a total loss. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Uh, thanks again for taking the time, and uh, for those of you who are watching, um, if you want to see more videos like this, please. Uh, like and subscribe and support us on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash stay home and read and links to buy Christie's book and uh, to support us are in the description below. Uh, so yeah, in the meantime, everybody stay safe out there and um, yeah, have a great day. Stay well. yeah. yeah. Okay. Let All me right. take care. Yep. You too.